in this video, we'll discuss Euclid and the elements. Now, we're first actually going to start with Alexander the Great, who reunited Greece and then started a worldwide campaign to conquer the world. As he would go along, he would build major cities in the areas that he conquered. In Egypt, that was the city of Alexandria, and this became a very prominent city because it became a major intersection for trade at that time. Now, Alexander the Great didn't last very long, and he actually died in the early 300s, and then his generals split up all of the, of the world that he had conquered. Ptolemy took over the area, which included Egypt and Alexandria, and helped the city thrive. And it remained the capital of Egypt for over a thousand years because of how successful it was as an intersection point. Now, one of the important components to Alexandria was the University of Alexandria, which was also called the Museum of Alexandria because it was the home of the muses. Ptolemy created it so that it would attract some of the best and brightest in science, art, literature, and mathematics uh, so that they could truly thrive and bring that knowledge to the city. For example, Euclid became... Uh, the headmaster of the School of Mathematics, and it was said that Archimedes was a student there and created his Archimedes screw while being a student at the university. We look at how the University of Alexandria was constructed, and many of our universities nowadays follow very similar patterns, with one of the key functions of it being the library. At that time, the library of the University of Alexandria was considered the greatest of the world and included what was considered all the known works of that time, which is over 500 or 50,000 books and 600,000 papyri. Now, while at uh, the University of Alexandria, it is said that Euclid wrote The Elements, which is a very comprehensive set of 13 books in, in very many different topics beyond just geometry. It's said to include works that are hundreds of years old, starting with the Thales and the Pythagoreans. And if we look at what is in these books, we recognize that what we cover in high school geometry is only in six of these books of the 13. It included, though, not just plain geometry, but also many different numerical concepts such as number theory and ratio and proportions, irrational numbers, quadratics. Uh, and it's also one of the things that he constructed for sure that we know is the Euclidean algorithm. Since its time, it is considered the second most popular book by production behind the Bible. Nothing else has been as widely translated or circulated. One of the interesting things is because of how many times uh, the city of Alexandria was conquered, there is no original copy from this time period that still exists. Now, the elements are very important for many different reasons. One of those being that it is considered a, a true masterpiece for how we apply logic in mathematics. It started with axioms and postulates and then created some very foundational results that we still utilize today as we build our advanced mathematics. Additionally, because of how Euclid constructed it, it is considered uh, a template for how we construct all mathematical texts, and it shows a path for how to do rigorous proof that has become the foundation to much of the mathematics that we now teach. Now, the meaning of the word elements comes from the Greeks, where they looked at the elements of a deductive study being the key theorems for, that could be used for wide and general use in a given subject. If you think about how we think about the alphabet to how that constructs language, that is what the elements are to how we construct much of the mathematics. Now, it is important to recognize that this was not the known, all of the known geometry of this time. Even in this time period, Euclid is known to have wrote many different books, both in geometry and in other algebraic concepts. So just because there's 13 books and there's over 400 propositions, this is only a fraction or a portion of what was known by the Greeks of this time. Now, one concept that Euclid is explicitly given credit for is the Euclidean algorithm for the GCD. This is written about in Book 7, where he states that if you take two positive integers, you divide the larger by the smaller. If there is a remainder, you take the divisor and divide by the remainder. And you keep doing that process of divisor by remainder until the division works out exactly. That last divisor represents the GCD. So let's see this in practice. If I had 45 and 27, I'm going to take my larger, 45, divide by my smaller, 27. That does not divide evenly, so I have a remainder of 18. That means I need to take my divisor and divide by my remainder. 27 divided by 18, again, it's not even, so it's 1 with a remainder of 9. So I take my new divisor, 18, divide by my new remainder of 9. That does divide evenly. So that last 
divisor, 9, represents my GCD for 45 and 27. Now, Euclid was based in his elements around axioms and postulates. So it's important to recognize what is the difference between an axiom and a postulate as we look at the, these key concepts. An axiom is self-evident and is assumed statement, whereas a postulate is an assumed construction. Also, an axiom is an assumption that's common to all sciences, whereas a postulate is going to be an assumption specific to a particular science. So we've got broad versus very specific. In addition, the axiom is an assumption about something that is both obvious and acceptable, whereas a postulate is an assumption that may not necessarily be obvious or acceptable to the learner. So when we look at the five axioms that Euclid is founded on, we have that things are equal to the same or also equal to each other. If equals be added to equals, the wholes are equal. If equals are subtracted from the equals, the remainders are equal. Things that coincide with one another are equal to one another. And then the whole is always greater than the part. Whereas the postulates uh, yeah, about constructions, we can draw a line through any two points. We can construct a segment on that line. We can create a circle through any point with a given radius. All right angles have to be equal to one another. And then postulate five is the one that has always been, uh, for millennia, the one that causes controversy. If two lines are intersected by another line so that to make the interior angles on one side of that intersection sum to less than two right angles, then the lines will eventually intersect on the side as to which the sum of the two interior angles is less than two right angles. You look at the others, they're very short, they're very succinct. This one is a lot more information. So what is going on here? So let's take the idea that we take a, two lines cut by a transversal. If those same side interior angles on the left side are less than 180 degrees, we know that the two lines have to intersect on the left-hand side of the transversal. If they intersect, if they're less than 180 degrees on the right-hand side of the same side interior, that has to be where they intersect on the right-hand side of the transversal. However, if those two same side interior angles sum to 180 degrees, then those two lines never intersect. And what this proves then and gets to the foundation of the postulate is that it's possible to create two parallel lines in plane geometry.